to uh, the final examination of uh, Rachel Alexander's thesis on arts and politics. And I don't want to detract uh, from this presentation, but I can't resist because it strikes me as, in my estimation, Unprecedented, and all that may mean is that I don't get out very much, which is <laughs> my wife tells me. Um, so it, it may not be unprecedented for you, but it, it is unprecedented for me. Uh, I think for a, a few reasons. The first is uh, that it is a thesis entitled Contemplation. And contemplation is a state of mind. If you use the word mindfulness instead of contemplation, just pick up, just scroll through any magazine, newspaper. Is there anything that isn't mindfulness today? It's everywhere. And therefore, we might ask the question, what is, what is Rachel doing? Speaking about the obvious. We all contemplate in a variety of different ways. But that is precisely what begs the question, because uh, not everything is contemplation. We ruminate, we reflect, we reason, we remember. And those are different states and qualities of mind. <coughs> the question is, how do we know when contemplation is present? So like all obvious things, we easily miss them. The other feature of this is that is a motley crew of words, right? Uh, contemplation in political philosophy. Contemplation and politics. Contemplation and politics. I mean, uh, uh, parties, elections, Debates on the floor of Congress, uh, vanquishing your foes and your friends when necessary. Like, what could be more removed from a contemplative state of mind than politics? And philosophy, if contemplation is the quiet apprehension of things as they are, and philosophy is some rational account of all of this, contemplation seems also at odds with the task of philosophy. All by way of saying that uh, a very brave student steps into this morass to try to make sense of it. Contemplation is back, and uh, it, it's been around for a very long time. But now, armed with the instruments of neuroscience, contemplation is here. And Rachel looks at that and tries to situate it is it a Trojan horse for Buddhism? What is it? Why does it come under the auspices of neuroscience? Why are neuroscientists interested in the brain waves of monks? The highest expression of Western rationalism ends up in the heads of 
religious men and women. That is bizarre. It's bizarre. So, Rachel asks a very difficult question, which is, uh, is contemplation simply something Eastern, or whether there is some affinity between a contemporary contemplation and the Western tradition. My last observation, politics. It is very easy to miss what is political about this thesis. And I haven't asked her what is political about this thesis. The questions you don't ask. So, it, it is easy to think that it, it is about reinterpreting the canon of Western philosophy in the life of contemplation, but it's not. Rachel has her feet on the ground, and what she's interested in is liberal education. The education of men and women for citizenship. In the kind of community that we created here. It's an immediate practical question. What does it mean to be educated in something? For an undergraduate to step into that, it's done with a lot of uh, gumption, one of my favorite words, which is often confused with presumption. They're very different things. Because I think gumption has uh, a quality to it, which is enthusiasm. And Rachel is certainly Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, so as Professor Velasquez was just mentioning, contemplation and mindfulness um, we see everywhere. So I just took a few headlines from the past two weeks um, and put them together to give you a glimpse of contemplation and mindfulness in our various sectors of our culture. So March 28th, the journal Psychological Science came out with a study um, by the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at the University of California at Santa Barbara. And they took a random group of students, uh, 48 students who had already taken the GRE, split them into two groups. And one group they assigned to um, a mindfulness training course for two weeks. The other group they assigned to a nutrition course for two weeks. So the mindfulness training course um, focused on exercises of the breath um, and focused on awareness of thoughts and feelings, um, emotions that arise when, when you just step back and sit. And after the two weeks, they, um, the 48 students all took the GRE and the students who had um, taken the mindfulness course had fewer distracting thoughts throughout the testing process and um, higher GRE scores, more improvement than the group that had um, taken the nutrition-based course. On April 3rd, um, LinkedIn CEO Jeff Weiner posted on LinkedIn um, about the importance of scheduling nothing, which he's very serious about. Um, the New York Times uh, a few weeks ago had a headline in their business section, In Mindfulness, a Method to Sharpen Focus and Open Minds. The Huffington Post two days ago um, had a headline, Mindfulness Meditation Benefits, 20 Reasons Why It's Good for Your Mental and Physical Health. Um, Ohio Representative Tim Ryan has been getting a lot of coverage, a lot of press about his use of mindfulness to manage stress, chaos, and distraction. A few weeks ago, UVA, one, we're hitting closer to home now, um, opened the doors to its Contemplative Sciences Center. And um, a few weeks ago, we welcomed on campus University of Wisconsin professor Richard Davidson, um, who's one of the experts in the field of contemplative neuroscience. So. Um, after seeing all these headlines, you may be wondering what exactly is contemplation and what is mindfulness? Um, uh, German philosopher Joseph Pieper defines mindfulness as um, the silent perception of reality or knowing 
not as thinking, but as seeing or intuition. Um, so contemplation, uh, it, the term contemplation is a Western term. It has Western roots. And it comes from, it originates from the Latin word contemplatio, which translates the German, the Greek word theoria. Um, mindfulness, on the other hand, uh, it has Eastern roots. It translates the Pali word sati, which um, means bear attention. And Richard Davidson, when he was here and gave his talk um, at WNL, he defined mindfulness as non-judgmental awareness. So contemplation and mindfulness, and although they have very different um, backgrounds, have similar um, definitions, similar meanings. The, I focus as, um, you, from the headlines you'll see a lot of those headlines use mindfulness. A lot of um, s sections of culture, um, sectors of society use the term mindfulness. And on the other hand, higher ed education has been using the word contemplation, as we see with the UVA Contemplative Center, um, the Association for Contemplation in Higher Education. Um, so I, too, use contemplation in part to demonstrate the connection between contemplation and um, its roots in our Western um, philosophical tradition uh, from which the university was born. So if I, if I use contemplation and mindfulness, I trust that you'll understand that the meanings um, are similar for our purposes, but contemplation, there, there's a reason that that has been being used in higher education. So as Pieper and Davidson, Richard Davidson described, contemplation is awareness of the present moment. And if any of you have seen the sunset over Windfall Hill or the sunrise like from the top of um, House Mountain, you probably have experienced this. Um, this knowing as seeing, this um, immediate uh, perception, silent perception of reality. But one need not a majestic sunset or sunrise to experience contemplation. And um, in fact, many beginners to the practice of contemplation um, begin with the breath. Because as Don, uh, one of the yoga instructors here at WNL, describes in a lot of his classes, the breath is something we do unconsciously. Right now you're not thinking about breathing, but you're still breathing. You don't, you don't have to think about it. Um, it's, like, it's like a lot of things. We don't necessarily consciously form habits. We don't consciously form our perception. So by drawing the breath into our consciousness and um, focusing on the breath, we can possibly begin to um, attain a deeper awareness of those areas of the mind that are uh, unconscious, are, are not always part of our conscious thought. Um, so another thing about the breath is that it's always in the present moment. So when you focus on the breath, you bring your focus to the present moment. Um, this can seem like it's easier, than it, easier said than done, but our minds are always wondering, wandering. I mean, we're always thinking about like analyzing past events or anticipating future events. Even when we're focusing on a text we're reading or a class we're taking or a lecture, uh, you're probably all experiencing this right now. Your, your mind just constantly wanders. So contemplation, what that does, this practice brings you into the present moment, um, which is the, is the only reality we have. You know, the, those past events, those future events, they don't exist right now. The only real world is the, the moment right now. So, but when we think of political philosophy, um, contemplation probably isn't the first thing that comes to mind, as Professor Velasquez alluded to. Um, when most people think of political philosophy, philosophy, you probably think of two things, rhetoric and logical reasoning. Politicians give speeches, they aim to persuade, they appeal to emotions, all, all characteristics of rhetoric. Um, philosophy, on the other hand, philosophers um, attempt to or, or seek knowledge, truth, and reality by processes of logic, reason, um, and rational discourse. So when we combine the two, political philosophy, we get someone like Socrates. Socrates, although he abhorred um, the rhetoric of the sophists, he gave speeches. We see this in the Phaedrus. He gave, he, that's what he did. He gave speeches. He persuaded by inquiry and questioning. And we access him through dialogues, which are rational discourse, um, processes of logical reasoning. But 
Um, so, so if we understand political philosophy in this way, it seems like contemplation doesn't really belong. But consider that Socrates actually meditated. Um, we see this in the symposium. Before he enters the symposium, he's a little late because he's been standing outside, motionless, meditating. And this happens other times as um, Socrates gives speeches or um, engages in uh, discourse and debates. He, he'll all of a sudden be arrested. He'll stop and just meditate in the present moment. Um, so, so it, as it turns out, if we read Joseph Pieper, um, Socrates' meditative practice isn't necessarily, um, or wasn't unusual with our ancestors, the philosophers of ancient Greece and the Middle Ages. Um, Pieper points out that the ph philosophers of antiquity thought of knowledge in, in two modes. Um, the ratio, which was the um, rational, uh, discursive, um, logical form of knowledge and the intellectus, which is the more passive, um, receptive, contemplative, non-discursive mode of knowledge. Um, and Pieper the, said these philosophers, they, they considered both types of knowledge necessary. You need the ratio and the intellectus both to attain knowledge and truth. Um, they both make up the faculty of mind um, and man's knowledge. So, um, and Pierre Hadot, a French philosopher, emphasizes this. He gives other examples of um, the Greek schools um, being contemplative places. The, Greek, the curriculum of the Greek schools um, focused on a lot on breathing exercises, uh, meditations on death, examinations of conscious and conscience, and contemplation on nature. Um, and they all had, their aim was to have an, attain an awareness of the present moment. So, um, so when we consider all, all this, the contemplation, uh, just like the ratio, um, we find its origins in our Western political um, phil philosophical tradition. The intellectus and contemplation also um, has its roots in that tradition. Um, so I'd like to make a note right now about Pieper. Joseph Pieper and Pierre Hadot, um, philosophers such as these are uh, not the first nor the last to write about the need of contemplation um, in seeking knowledge, truth, and reality. I choose to, chose to focus my thesis on Joseph Pieper because he writes from a relatively modern standpoint. He wrote in the 50s and 60s, and, but within the classical, um, our classical Western tradition. Um, so for our purposes, I thought Joseph Pieper was appropriate to study. So now you're probably asking if the intellectus makes up half of the faculty of mind, um, what does it, it allow for that the ratio does not? To begin with, um, the intellectus allows for uh, an exper experiential learning. Um, we all no doubt have uh, experienced the necessity of experiential learning at some point in our education. Consider um, when you were in second or third grade and you learned about the concept of gravity. Um, so if, if, if someone had told you when you were seven or eight um, that gravity is the force that pulls bodies um, to the center of the earth, you probably wouldn't have fully understood what gravity means. And no amount of notes and arrows on the board um, or logical reasoning would have helped. You can imagine someone new to the concept of gravity reasoning, like my feet aren't glued to the ground, um, I can jump and run, there's not a hand like pulling me down to the ground. So I, I don't know about you, but when I learned about gravity, um, elementary teachers had us dropping different sized objects um, to the ground to see what the force of gravity does, um, doing trust falls with friends outside to see how we experience gravity. Um, the intellectus and contemplation allow for this experiential learning. Pieper um, defines or explains the ratio and the intellectus in this way. He says, ratio is the power of discursive logical thought, of searching and of examination, of abstraction, of definition and drawing conclusions. Intellectus, so that those, those things that he just listed in the ratio, that's what we normally encounter in the classroom. That's, that's normally the way we learn, is through those um, uh, 
examination, abstraction, definition, drawing conclusions. The intellectus, on the other hand, is the name for the understanding insofar as it is the capacity of simplex intuitus of that simple vision to which truth offers itself like a landscape to the eye. Um, the, we can see how in experience we, we have this type of knowing. When you're in an experience, you don't stop and deliberate and rationalize what's happening. It's just immediate. It's intuitive. It's knowing as seeing. So the intellectus and um, contemplation can open up room for this kind of experiential learning. And if we still um, have some doubts about whether experiential learning is really necessary, consider the value we place on study abroad. Um, Professor Dick Vick isn't here yet, but he, if you took a, a class on Ghanaian politics at WNL and, and you compared that to his spring term abroad in Ghana, there's no comparison. I mean, they're both learning the same thing in the classroom, but the experiential component that st the study abroad and WNL's wonderful spring term abroad programs offer um, comp like seriously augment the, the learning that, that goes on. Um, so, What con contemplation in the classroom allows for is as we step back and become aware of the thoughts, emotions, and feelings that arise constantly in our mind, whether we're aware of it or not, it's happening. As we take, give that space to acknowledge those, we allow connections to be made between outside experiences that we have and concepts we're learning in the classroom. So it's inviting that experiential component, um, even if we aren't in the place you know in Ireland or in Italy you know where we're the place where the what we're reading you know what we're learning about took place you can still invite those experiences that can um, you know but through contemplation through the intellectus we can invite that experiential component to learning and um, Chris and I took a class this fall um, on politics 396 that where we, we experience the possibilities that can open up when, um, when you invite the intellectus. So um, when you give that space, we were learning about Steve Jobs, and as we're reading about Steve Jobs and his technological creations, we decided how about we write blogs. We can get a little better understanding maybe of Jobs' viewpoint of the world. So blogs were never on our syllabus. If we hadn't had that awareness of the present moment, if we had been wed to the syllabus which had been created three months ago, not, not in the present, then we would have never been able to do these blogs. Here's a picture of what, what they looked like. So we started these blogs, oh and Todd, Todd did too, I didn't realize you were here. So we started these blogs and, um, and uh, the two weeks after I started mine I got a notification, a comment from um, Mirabai Bush. Mirabai Bush is one of the founders of the Center for Contemplative Mind and Society, which is one of the first contemplative organizations in the U.S. She, she is one of the founders of contemplative studies in America. So two weeks after starting these blogs, I get a comment on one of my posts about contemplation from her. Um, so th this kind of thing would have never happened if we had been, if we hadn't allowed the space and the possibility for, um, you know, new things, new experiences um, for the class to take its course and not necessarily, um, st you know, stick to what we had uh, mapped out at the beginning. Um, and we continue to do this in other classes. So uh, there was a snow day where a lot of people had class canceled, but um, in our classical political philosophy class, we went out and made a snowman. Seems a little juvenile, but we had been reading George Steiner's Grammars of Creation, in which he talks about the inherent violence in creation. So as we made this snowman, we were literally able to experience the violence we were doing to that freshly um, set layer of snow on the colonnade. Um, it, it, we were inviting experiential learning, and that, that couldn't have happened without that space that contemplation and the intellectus allows for in the classroom. Um, and there, there's a science behind all this. So Francisco Barella, Barella um, a Chilean biologist and neuroscientist, um, and Evan Thompson and Eleanor Rush wrote a book called The Embodied Mind, and they talked about how um, they, they brought to light the need for the integration of human experience and an awareness of mind with cognitive science. Um, and they talked about a shift in cognitive science um, from viewing the world as a, an independent, pre-given, objective reality to viewing it as um, 
embodied. It. You know, our, our structures, uh, the structures of our brain influence the way we perceive reality. Um, they they show, demonstrated this through many experiments, one being color perception. Um, when you view color, uh, the, the, ob the color of an object, or the perceived color of an object, does not entirely depend on the locally reflected light. Um, it's also influenced by the objects surrounding it and by the viewer's senses. Um, so this, this is true with not only color, but with the way we perceive reality. And this, I'm obviously not saying that reality is entirely subjective. If I, I stand here and say, I have blonde hair, I still have brown hair. Like, nothing I say is gonna change that. But consider this, if I showed you these three pictures and asked you which one is a picture of a chair, not knowing your perspective to the pictures, you will probably choose the one all the way to the left. Um, they're all pictures of the chair. The one in the middle, the wooden surface, the one all the way to the right is a microscopic picture of the wood of the chair. But perspective matters. And then consider if an alien walked in who had never seen a chair. And do you think that they would automatically know that the chair is a piece of furniture for sitting? That shows that experience influences our perception of reality. So um, Barella and Roche and Thompson in The Embodied Mind brought this to light in cognitive science, but it's, it's really restating what Pieper um, said all along, that we need um, the intellectus, we need that half of mind that considers pers perception, perspective, experience um, as we seek knowledge, truth, and reality. Um, so, to close, I'd just like to say we stand at an interesting moment in Western education as MOOCs, you know, spread the globe. Online ep education is practically free, so it, the question is going to become more and more pressing, what's the university for? If you can get this education for free online from your home, why would you come to a university? And like four days ago, David Brooks posed the same question in his op-ed. He said, the best part of the rise of online education is that it forces us to ask, what is the university for? Um, in the closing of the, just to name one, uh, one person who has said this, in the closing of the American Mind, Alan Bloom says, the university is an investigation of the question, what is man? And so if the university, if that's our purpose to consider, um, is, if that's part of our purpose, to consider what is the human experience, what does it mean to be human, we must consider, then that, that means that we must consider human experience and we must allow space for the intellectus and contemplation. Um, so I'll end with a quote by, um, President John D. Wilson. He was former president of WNL. Um, he passed about a month ago. And um, in an interview with the WNL Alumni Magazine, he was asked, What do you see these four years as what, what's the purpose of these four years? And he said, These four years are a precious gift to young people to learn something about the life of the mind, to try to get close to the notion of contemplation. So that's my presentation. Thank you all for coming. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Yes? Rachel, I'd like to go back to Professor uh, Crossway's opening, where he raised a question uh, premised on the title about the connection between contemplation and politics, and the contemplation philosophy. philosophy. Contemplation and politics. Uh, and you usefully had the Tim Ryan uh, headline on a member of Congress who manages his day based on uh, meditation. In your thesis, you, you repeatedly throw this line from James Shaw into the thesis. There are things beyond politics, and without which politics cannot be politics. And yet, you don't seem to explain what you mean, why that sentence is there. It seems like that sentence would be at the beginning of paragraphs, and what would follow would explain why you're for throwing that out there for us to, uh, to digest. Now, in a regime of liberalism like ours, it's pretty clear that we do segregate or separate the political, the public from private activities. And so, you know, one would celebrate that there are things beyond politics without which politics cannot be politics. That would be a good thing. But 
what do you mean by that? Why is it that you throw that out there repeatedly? Well, um, I have, I do have an endnote that um, I talk about this a little bit in, but um, so there, I, I, I'm paraphrasing right now, but there's a quote from, um, I think it's Aquinas, that uh, politics or the, the forming of a society or a political body, um, its aim should be to towards uh, allowing those those citizens um, contemplation. So um, the um, and George Will and in, in I read the state statecraft as soulcraft. Um, George Will talks about how in in Washington, a very practical city politicians often miss the most, what he calls the most practical thing, which would be to, contemplation, to contemplate what it means to be human. Um, politicians and, and policymakers, he says, need to contemplate that before they, they make laws. Um, so contemplation right there, there, there are people suggesting, su suggesting that po contemplation can be used um, in policymaking, in forming laws um, to, the benef to, to its benefit. Um, but, and, and Aquinas shows or, or suggests that the, the aim of a political body is to create a society, a place where its people can contemplate. And we, we kind of see that in the preamble. Um, the preamble starts, we the people, um, to form a more perfect union, uh, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. So why would we ensure domestic tranquility um, if not, you know, it, tranquility means quiet, um, silence. Why would we uh, ensure that we have that here if not for contemplation? Obviously it's not just so people can sleep quietly. Um, so uh, the, the quote that and, and the quote that James V. Shaw says I think it is appropriate because there are also obviously um, contemplatives who push uh, Sebastian de Grazia is one. He, he argues that contemplation requires a detachment from a society. So it, it requires like a detachment from politics. Um, contemplation and mindfulness, I, I think, illuminate the connection between, as I've shown, your different experiences, relationships. So I, I disagree with that contemplation requires a detachment. But he says, even if it requires a detachment, um, from politics, from society, from culture, that in and of itself makes contemplation political. Because if there's something that makes politics unnecessary, then certainly it would be a political theory. So, um, so I think I, I like James V. Shaw's quote because it shows that contemplation is political whether you think it requires the stepping back from politics or engaging in politics. So are you agreeing or disagreeing? I think it's beyond it's beyond politics, but we can't have politics without it. Are there other things? Are there beyond politics? Yeah, beside contemplation. What would they do? Um I mean private private relationships, like private life. <laughs> No, I didn't. <laughs> in the Lincoln movie, uh, screenwriter made a big deal of Lincoln, uh, Lincoln's knowledge of Euclid's uh, first six books, uh, Euclid's Elements, so the standard geometry textbook in the early uh, 19th century. And Euclid begins with axioms, the things that one knows simply by apprehending them. In other words, not by deducing them, not by syllogism, not by ratiocination. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as your mind sees the thing, you understand it. What is the point? What is the line? Right, the line, breathless length. That makes sense without you seeing a zillion examples. Your mind sees it, knows it. The difference between a circle and a square. You don't see, give me more examples and I'll figure that out. You immediately apprehend it. I use the word apprehend, I think in your thesis you use the word perception. Mm -hmm. that you immediately perceive. Euclid, Aesop, the Declaration of Independence, it seems to me these are uh, figures or documents that require an action of the mind that doesn't flow from ratio. But I think they flow from noose or intellectus. Is that what you're getting at? That this is something we bring to civil society uh, without which we can't do the, all the other things like form public policy 
example, second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be things we deduce, <laughs> things we hypothesize. Now, we hold these truths to be self-evident. First one being that all men are created equal. We don't ask for a thousand examples of human beings and then say, I get it, that's different from a dog. We need meat, oh, Sesame Street, how about that? One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> one of these things just doesn't belong. <laughs> I'm purposely not trying to sing that. <laughs> it's that is that what you're you're getting at when you when you say that politics requires yes ratio, but also this other act of the mind that in a way is not acting. It just it happens as soon as your mind uh, looks at it. Yes, yeah, certainly. I think that intellectus is absolutely engaged in the, all the instances you just provided, but I think also. Um, I'm, I'm arguing for uh, silence, you, you know, that, uh, more space than just those things that we read and know immediately. Um, I think that we could, f for some of the things that aren't necessarily self-evident, contemplation can ben uh, come to our aid, um, just stepping back and taking a breath to allow, you know, our, our minds to rest. Let me ask a question of clarification then. You brought into this discussion um, experiential learning. Uh, contemplation prepares the way for experiential learning or is experiential learning? Contemplation allows for experiential learning. So if you, in, in contemplation, when you step back and um, become aware of the thoughts, it, like take coming into the classroom. Normally, the standard procedure is you come into the classroom and there's kind of a barrier between your social life and your sports life, your extracurriculars, and the classroom. It's like you, your aim is to focus on what's you know, the task at hand. But I think by, say, having a few minutes of silence at the beginning of class just to be mindful, then that allows, when you become aware of the thoughts and ex thoughts and emotions that are arising, that invites connections between experiences you're having outside of the classroom and concepts you're learning in the classroom. So that, that in and of itself, making those connections is inviting an experiential component to learning. Does that answer your question? Rachel, I have a question. Um, I, I, one of my new book projects is uh, Contemplative Reading. Mm -hmm. And uh, human nature and, and, and public policy and success. And I'm just curious. Um, uh, this awareness of the present moment, are we wired to do this? Does this come naturally, or do we have to work at it? Because a lot of your examples, you know, keep on the sign up for classes, and then kind of like yoga class or something, mm -hmm. suggest this does not come naturally to us. Um, I think that the way our, our society is so fast paced with a lot of great things, technology, um, new, new social media sciences are all great things and can certainly benefit education, but it makes, it, I think it's wired us to become so fast paced that we no longer find it natural to be in the present moment. So I don't know that, that it was always unnatural, but I think now it can be beneficial for, for people who want to start taking contemplation seriously or um, to start with breathing exercises and, and practices, things that, yeah, it doesn't sound like that's something natural, but. Yeah, and, and to probe a little further, uh, a lot of things that come natural might have been designed you know, by evolution to help us succeed in the world. So we often spend time thinking about the past, anticipating the future, mm -hmm. um, kind of as a natural physiological process. Um, uh, would we would we be wired, I'll just use that term, but physiologically made um, to, to sit quietly and what would be the benefit? Um. I mean, I just think part of being human is investigating those existential questions. What, why are we here? So that, that requires a, a sit, sitting down, a stepping back. Um, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the science behind uh, evolution and physiology, but I would have to think that that serves some practical use. We're not just here to like survive. <laughs> Well, I'm, I, again, I'm interested because public policy 
you know, it is a design to push us into something that would or wouldn't come naturally. And when, when can we justify that? We have to, we have to show the good, uh, um, you know, everything from school children uh, uh, to other things. So again, I'm just curious, is this, is this a, re a return to how we're, how we're actually wired um, that we've lost touch with? Uh, or, is it, or is it something new and unnatural that we're pushing ourselves to do the way that we do many other things that might, might seem unnatural? Like thinking very, very logically. Well, I think, it, I think my thesis, like, in part was to show that it's both something that was once prevalent and natural um, with the philosophers of ancient Greece in the Middle Ages, and, but it also seems foreign and new. It's, it, it seems, if you see someone just sitting outside silently, that seems kind of odd. Um, but I don't think... Their phone, right? right, right. But, um, but some of these uh, philosophers and historians show us that that maybe was, used to be more normal, used to be uh, more natural. Does that help? Okay. Any other questions? Well, quick yeah. practical political one. Uh, mm -hmm. Tim Ryan is Mr. P90X and Mr. Contemplation. Okay. If you were to become president and wanted to inculcate contemplation uh, for the body politics sake, is this something done by law or better by example? Um, how do we practice as it were. Um, I think it's a starting point is with schools. Um, you know, it's, a lot of schools are starting to do this in elementary schools and finding that uh, social emotional learning, I think is what they call it, is beneficial for um, developing those like skills like uh, attention span and um, concentration that we've always wanted to instill in young children anyway. So um, I think that's definitely a good starting point. And I, I think higher education, um, I don't think it's necessarily a law that would be put into place, but just bringing it to the forefront in a university, bringing it to people's attention, that contemplation uh, is beneficial, has these benefits. That it's not just like taking a break, like, oh, I'm gonna take a break from school, like give myself a little like spring break. It's, it's something that should be a part of our everyday life. So Obama should make it part of the race to the top grants that the Department of Education is giving out. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> 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 I mean. I, I, I just heard last week, and I didn't know this, uh, I homeschool, so I don't know what's going on in the public schools. I just heard that many schools are actually getting rid of recess. They want them in the building more. They want them to be doing more things more concertedly. That would be going in the wrong direction, according to your thesis. Yes, yes. <laughs> Unless they were practicing something in the building that was contemplative. Well, I still think recess would be <laughs> necessary. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Maps. Thank you. So to extend Professor Morell's question a little bit, um, if W. and L. professors wanted to do something to promote contemplation or mindfulness <laughs> practices in their classes, what sorts of things might we do? And I teach philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. You might not think it's odd to be doing that in a philosophy course, but you think it's odd to do it in a math class, right? So uh, just how do you think that could be implemented here? If there were people who voluntarily, or let's say professors who voluntarily wanted to engage in well, there, um, there are a lot of good, uh, good examples out there. I list a, a few of the syllabi um, that have been circulating in the within the uh, Association for Contemplative Mind and Higher Society in my bibliography. But like one example, you mentioned math. Um, David Levy is a professor of um, information technology at the University of Washington. And he um, implements like breathing exercises and different mindfulness exercises in his classes to compensate for like the overstimulation and distraction that technology um, and, and divided attention that technology often produces. So, um, but there, there are ton, tons of different um, ways that teachers have been, uh, professors have been implementing this. Like, um, David Levy talks about uh, co contemplative calligraphy. Um, some professors have been having like yoga, uh, implementing like yoga classes outside of um, their normal class time or, or just moments of silence. Um, so, and, and there's, right now, um, the ACMHE is d 
developing like guidelines for professors who do want to start implementing this. And one thing that they emphasize is that the professor um, would need to be like a, a, practicing contemplative practices seriously um, themselves because you obviously can't like ask your students to start doing something that you, you haven't been doing. So um, I, I, it definitely would start there, but there are a lot of opportunity, a, lo a lot of options out there. Do you see any reasons why students might object? And I'm not suggesting they would. I'm, this, is a, this is a sincere question. Might object to this? Um, yeah, I think that it's important. Yes, I think so. I think Pieper talks about like in, our, in the modern day and age, um, our modern philosophy has become to view the human being as, the, as a worker. So we view work is what's valuable. Like a resume is, can, can sum us up. Um, and even like starting with high schoolers, you have to have a really extensive resume to get in somewhere like here. So I think if you start asking students to like stop and breathe, they're gonna be like, this is a waste of time. Because we've wired us, we've all been wired to think of um, getting ahead success as work and like doing. So I, I definitely think people will be certainly shocked to begin with, but. <laughs> Our mind starts to like shut off for three to four minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah, yeah. There are studies that show that um, that students, no matter how, like, we might all protest to this, but like over the past hour, you were not able to focus on what I was saying the entire time. Like, there are studies that show that that it starts off, I think, with ten minutes, and then after that, it's like you zone in and out for like five minute increments or something. Um, so I think bringing those kinds of uh, studies to light will help show that contemplation is, is something beneficial. Yeah, and I would add the, the leading uh, policy analysis book by Eugene Bardash, the first step um, to, to thinking about a policy problem is to just stop and think, like for days. And uh, he says, this sounds unnatural because you're getting paid to work. And uh, so, so, you know, it, it, it's been recognized as valuable even by practitioners, you know, that, that that's the most important thing you can do is stop gathering evidence and working, and just, just spend time thinking and, and use word combination. Any other questions? Yeah. So you talked about examples of contemplation being anywhere from being outside during the sunset to calligraphy. Have you come across like a maximum level of activity that once you get past it, you're no longer being diligent? Um, in P in Bhante Gunaratana, I read he has a book, Mindfulness in Plain English, and um, he he sa says it takes a long time, but that serious practitioners or practitioners of mindfulness will get to a point where you're doing the dishes and you realize you're like engaging in mindfulness so I, I don't know from personal experience I haven't uh, I haven't reached that point but it's possible according to him but Pieper does say one of his my favorite quotes of his is that our great the greatest menace to contemplation is overstimulation so